All right, everybody. Let's try this this time with no tricks, no toys, no tools, and see if you can start to get it this way. This stuff being the moment is supposed to carry through to many other structures. So I'm going to just put a structure that you'll want to be able to try to solve later or maybe today. And that is this concept of the internal forces in a truss, right? Those of you who've worked all the problems might realize you might have worked this already, but you might want to know why it was that this member broke or why it was that this member broke. And so one of the first and most important things to realize is how do you solve for the reactions? So let's go through the basics again. Not the mathematics, just the basics of the geometry. If in fact you have a force applied, let me go ahead and change the pen color. If you have a force applied here, how it is reacted to there. First step, you replace the reactions with the requisite number of unknowns. When you don't know them, you draft them in positive direction with one unit. That's implying that you know the direction but you do not know the magnitude. Then essentially what you can do is you're just going to compare in this in fact if this is your force you put your finger here and you say that's my spinny point and you draft if you want to think of it two different ways you draft a line perpendicular to the line of force. Remember this line of force. Another way to think about that is that you're drafting a circle that's tangent to the line of force. That distance here is called the moment arm times the magnitude of the force. It gives you the value of the moment. This moment is spinning, if you remember, we're calling this positive, this positive here, and this a positive moment. You see that this moment is spinning in a negative direction, force times orthogonal distance. This one here, obviously I did that wrong. That should be a one unit in the y direction. And why you draft that force there is perhaps so you can then swing a larger circle perpendicular through here. And then what you know is the reaction at B is going to be essentially a ratio of the circles. times the force that you're talking about, if we call that F. And you have to remember you're farther away in this case, so it's going to be the ratio that is the smaller one. If you're closer, then it's the larger one. And so you once again get back to this concept of less or more, and then ratios. So once again, you draft the line of force, you put your finger on the spinny point, you draft a circle around there, and you compare it to the circle to that one. Now, if you want to go, let's see if we can do a little penny racing here. Let's see. Let's say you're going to do... That's pretty sweet. Let's say you want to do the other reaction. So you've calculated the reaction at B. You're going to do the same thing. You're going to put your finger on B. You want to, I'm sorry, solve for the reaction at A in the Y direction there. Of course, because the reaction at A in the X direction has no moment arm about that point. Once again, you draft a line. You call it the moment arm line, more or less, in the direction of the line of force, and you draft, draw that circle. And the definition of this moment now will be a positive moment. This force times this distance. And then you draft the other circle as well. In other words, the circle is centered on your point of rotation. And then you write the reaction at A is equal to a ratio times the force here. And once again, the ratio is probably going to be smaller 
And because this was spinning this way, this has to spin back so you get your reaction there. The final thing that to remember to do when you're doing it by hand or otherwise, I'm going to take this one through, is to solve for this reaction here. You pick a point of concurrency up here, and this goes all the way back to solving concurrent forces. You pick that point of concurrency, which means this reaction falls out, this reaction remains, and you have this force in this direction, times which you've already calculated, times this orthogonal distance, or in fact, this circle, if you think, compared to this radial distance, and you once again compare those circles, and you get the reaction here, which becomes negative in the x. So going through that process by hand for one force is useful. And now let me go to when you have a few forces. I think many of you have already seen that. Click on this, hit a cut, go to pens. If, in fact, you can take the time, I'll do it on one of the examples that we've used over and over again, or will use over and over again. I'll just use three, two forces. If you have that force there and this force there and you want to solve for the reactions here and here, once again you replace your reactions with the requisite number of unknowns. But you can take this process of sliding a vector, right, those together, take this vector here and slide it up and then add this one to it, something like that. So this is no longer here, this is no longer here, this is no longer here, and you have something that looks something like this. This is your resultant. And now you can do the same thing. Force times orthogonal distance, that circle, compares to this circle, and that you get your reaction at here to this kind of resultant. So this sense of, try to sketch that one more time, just go back with the pens and the erase. This is something you would like to, to be able to do by hand. So you have a good general number of what you expect. I'll show you again with something similar. Let's look at it this time with something with has a distributed load. Put something across here with a reaction, a roller joint there and a pin joint there, and maybe it has a distributed load right here. Remember you take the area of distributed load, you place it actually, if you're smart, you put it right at the centroid, you got a force down there. Let's say at the same time you had a force pushing on something there. You can add those vectors together, right? You'd have to slide this one down, it would be way down here, and this one over, and then you get some sort of force that looked like that. Force times distance equals force times distance. You can do it with circles. And I'll try to bring in Sketchpad next week, or suggest some of you look at some of these apps, so you can kind of get a sense of this is all one big, if you believe it or not, and I said it before, one big wheelbarrow problem many, many different times over. And it will help you with many different things over time, so much for my wheelbarrow, to get this sense that this is going on in plants and trees and all kinds of different things where if you have a tree here, it has a mass and a weight spinning down there, therefore inside there you have a reaction. That's why you cut a little bit here and then all along there. So that's one more stab at it and we'll continue to work this theme until you can base, do basic reaction problems because when you can do base, ex, basic external reaction problems you can do basic internal reaction problems you then will know how to size and think about one of the most important things in engineering, which is making your structures so they telegraph before they fail. Thanks for listening.